Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to the third and final day of our annual banking conference with our theme this year of responsible banking. On day one, we examined what responsible banking means for banks around the world, hearing from, amongst others, Cathay, Handelsbanken, ING, National Australia Bank. And on day two, we looked at how the UN principles for responsible banking are being implemented by banks, including BBVA and NatWest, and we heard from the UN team behind the principles themselves. Two key points I took away from our earlier sessions for the benefit of, of those who weren't able to join us are, firstly, the, the breadth of what we mean when we talk about responsible banking. I and mean, I could spend the next 10 minutes talking about this alone. In fact, I've written most of a chapter of a book on definitions. But for today, let's agree that responsible banking includes Firstly, green finance, so that's aligning finance with the objectives of the Paris Agreement and broader environmental sustainability objectives, such as protecting biodiversity loss and protecting the oceans. Secondly, sustainable finance, how banks and bankers play much wider roles in supporting sustainable economic growth and the transition to a more sustainable world as perhaps best expressed in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And thirdly, encompassing a fully customer and community centric, I guess a human centric approach to banking, sort of one that goes beyond um, aspects of environmental and social sustainability um, to, to a position where banks are in general responsible lenders are supporting all customers, particularly those who are vulnerable, where banks are promoting financial inclusion and education. And there is a a real sense of shared social purpose and a desire to create genuine shared prosperity for current and future generations of not just shareholders, but customers and communities, the stakeholders alike. The second key point I took away from our first two days was the extent to which many major financial institutions in many parts of the world are already working to align their strategies, their activities, and their lending and investment decisions with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and the principles for responsible banking. And we've heard some great examples of this uh, already, especially from uh, Ollie Holborn from NatWest and uh, Tony from BBVA yesterday. At a global level, there are now more than 250 banks signed up to the Principles for Responsible Banking, launched two years ago yesterday. So happy birthday to our colleagues and friends at the UN. And uh, the principles or the signatories now represent nearly half of global banking assets under management. There are smaller but very significant groups of banks that have established more specific initiatives, in particular the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS, whose 160 members commit to using science-based guidelines to reach net zero by 2050 at the latest and set themselves challenging interim targets for 2030. And those are targets around financed emissions, not just the bank's own direct emissions. Now, despite such considerable progress in recent years, especially since the signing of the Paris Agreement in 2015 and the substantial levels of support for the principles for responsible banking and GFANS, we have to remember that sustainable finance and responsible banking still have a very long way to go, though, until they become, as I believe they must, the mainstream of finance. You know, they are still in their infancy, in the foothills of implementation, to use Ollie's phrase from yesterday. We heard over the past two days many examples of best practice from financial institutions, but to align finance and sustainability, best practice must become standard practice across financial services. Now, the green bond, the green loan, ESG investment and, and other markets may be growing, and they are growing quickly, but they still account for only a small proportion of financial services overall. You know, this week's UK government's uh, green guilt issue was very successful, highly oversubscribed, but green bond issuance is still less than 3% of overall bond issuance, for example. Globally, lending and investment portfolios are aligned with considerably more than three degrees of warming at present, and the financing of fossil fuels still considerably outweighs climate finance. You know, our world is still built on an economic model powered by fossil fuels, and it's still financed on that basis. And with some two thirds of finance overall and 90% of finance in the developing world coming from banks, as we heard from Puleng from the UN principles responsible banking team on day one, that is a considerable problem for us. 
but it also represents a considerable opportunity. However, aligning banking with sustainability and the principles for responsible banking and doing this rapidly enough to keep global warming as close to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels as possible and meet the challenging mid-century and interim decarbonisation targets for banks is challenging in practice for a number of reasons. But let me briefly highlight five of those that have emerged over the course of the sessions this week. Firstly, there's the need for more consistent global approaches to policy regulation and especially definitions around sustainability. Secondly, there's the need for realistic global carbon pricing, so the real costs and externalities of carbon are factored in and then affect the, rel the relative costs of capital for high and low carbon firms, sectors and technologies. Thirdly, there are the technical challenges of measuring emissions and other sustainability factors through lending and investment portfolios. That's a very complex process, uh, as those of you involved with that will know. Fourthly, there's a lack of consistent and comparable data to support capital allocation decisions. And then finally, there's the lack of capacity and capability, even within the largest, best resourced financial institutions to support this agenda. And that's something that very much came out over the course of the first two days and is where I'd like to focus today. And I hope point us towards some solutions. So two questions. Firstly, how do we build the capacity and capability we need to align banking and finance with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and the principles for responsible banking? And how do we turn best practice into standard practice across financial services? Part of the answer lies in appropriate governance, leadership, and aligning incentives with these. But most of the answer, I believe, lies in upskilling and reskilling in education and training which is, after all, our core activity here at the Chartered Banker Institute and has been since 1875. So I think we and our fellow banking institutes around the world, some of whom you'll meet on our panel in just a few minutes, have plenty of relevant expertise on the subject, as well as some strong views about it too. So let me share some of mine. Now, in the specific context of the transition to net zero, UN Special Envoy Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, has called in the COP26 private finance strategy for a realignment of the finance sector so that every professional decision takes climate change into account. This isn't just a strategy for COP26 to be held in Scotland some 40 days from now. It's a strategy beyond COP26 to align finance with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. As Steve Pateman, our president, told us on Tuesday, to pass what we call the Carney test, if every professional financial decision is to include climate change, then every finance professional needs to develop their knowledge and understanding of climate change, green finance, sustainability, to the extent relevant to their role and organisation. This then needs to be applied to advise, to finance and support customers and communities as they transition to more sustainable, low carbon futures. In other words, to mainstream green and sustainable finance, we have to mainstream green and sustainable finance knowledge and skills too, to turn best practice into standard practice, which implies upskilling and reskilling not just small teams of ESG and sustainability specialists, but all bankers, or at least a very substantial majority of bankers. And I think we must be equally ambitious in terms of responsible banking more broadly, encompassing but not stopping at climate change, as we've heard throughout this week. So to pass what I'm going to call the Thompson test, then every banker needs to develop their knowledge and understanding of the much broader area of responsible banking, including green and sustainable finance, but also including responsible lending, supporting vulnerable customers, promoting financial inclusion and education, and understanding the ethical and social purpose of banking and finance. And then also apply this knowledge to advise, to finance, to support customers, businesses, and communities, with the goal of creating shared sustainable prosperity that encompasses economic, environmental and social aspects. This doesn't, I should stress, require all bankers to become deep ESG or sustainability specialists themselves. And it doesn't require doubling, quadrupling or even increasing tenfold the number of specialist sustainability professionals working in finance. Because though that will help, it's not going to move the dial sufficiently and certainly not quickly enough. What it needs is banks and bankers using their professional knowledge and skill of banking, of credit and lending, of investment, of risk management to do what we do best, 
that's transforming savings into productive investments. In this case, lending and investing in sectors, in firms, in technologies, in projects that generate sustainable environmental and social returns alongside financial ones. This isn't philanthropy, it's not CSR, it's about applying the universal principles and practices of professional banking through a lens of sustainability and responsible banking to generate both financial returns for shareholders and sustainable sustainability returns for society. And I'd like to underline that point. This isn't philanthropy or CSR, it is simply good business. But this means that all bankers everywhere need to develop their knowledge of green and sustainable finance and responsible banking so that what is currently thought of as best practice becomes standard practice, the new professional norms that banking and finance are built on. So that's our capacity and capability challenge, one that is substantial even in the most developed banking markets, but one the UN, the World Bank and others see as even more of a barrier in emerging markets where banking and capital markets themselves are underdeveloped. Meeting this challenge of capacity and capability requires an ambitious collective response that matches the collective ambition of finance sector initiatives and coalitions, such as the principles for responsible banking and the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. In fact, the two are linked as the PRB will not be embedded in finance and GFAN's members will not meet their commitments without dramatic and sustained investment in upskilling and reskilling. And that's where we come in at the Chartered Banker Institute, and that's where our colleagues and partners in banking institutes worldwide come in too, because we can and we do bring together the core banking skills with the knowledge of green and sustainable finance and responsible banking needed. It's a priority for us all because responsible banking is undoubtedly the future of banking, but it is a future that depends on us dramatically increasing that capacity and capability, upskilling and reskilling all finance professionals so that a culture based on green and sustainable finance and responsible banking principles and practices and values is developed and sustained throughout banking. Again, so that what's now best practice becomes standard practice. Only then will we truly align finance with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and with the UN principles for responsible banking. And we must align finance with these because all of our futures and the futures of those who follow us depend upon it. More immediately though, our futures depend on an expert, insightful, and I hope entertaining panel discussion around some of the themes I've introduced. So it is my great pleasure now to introduce my colleague and the Chartered Banker Institute's Head of Professional Development, Jennifer Prue, to introduce the panel and our panel members. Thanks, Simon. <clears throat> that was extremely insightful and I'm very much looking forward to picking up on some of the points that um, you raised during the panel session. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Jennifer Crew, and I'm Head of Development at the Chartered Banker Institute, as Simon mentioned. I'm delighted to be chairing today's panel session. So we've covered many aspects of responsible banking over the last two days. We've looked at what responsible banking means to different organisations. We've looked at how the UN principles for responsible banking have been implemented by banks. And today we'll be focusing on what responsible banking means for the education, training and development of bankers and how we can address the capacity and capability issues of banking that Simon mentioned earlier. So effectively, we'll be looking at what has been done to assist bankers and finance professionals to develop the responsible banking skills to build their knowledge and also to increase their confidence. So I'm delighted to be joined by four expert panellists in what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking and stimulating discussion. So I'm joined first of all by Dr Hank Wan, who is the president of TABF, which is the Taiwan Academy of Banking and Finance. So good morning, Hank. Oh, Hank, I think you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Hello yes. there, how are you? Fine, thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to everyone. Thank you. Fantastic. 
Thank you. We're also joined by Chris Whitehead, who is the Chief Executive of Finzia, based in Australia. So good evening to you, Chris. I'll have to say good day to you. That'll be a bit shorter. <laughs> Great to have you with us. And we're joined by Datuk Nora Manif, who is Group Chief Human Capital Officer at Maybank and also Chairman of the Asian Institute of Chartered Bankers Human Resource Industry Networking Group and a member of the Board Examiners. So it's fantastic to have you with us, Nora. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me in. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. And finally, but by no means least, we're joined by Philip Cam, who is General Manager of the Hong Kong Institute of Bankers. So welcome to you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, just want to say hi to everybody around the world, um, wherever you are. Um, um, hopefully you can get a lot out of our sharing today. Indeed. So thanks, Philip. So a very warm welcome to all our panellists and also to all our participants today. I'm sure we're going to have a great session. So before we begin, just a final point and simply to say that if any of the audience has a question, please feel free to use the chat function. We do have time set aside at the end of the panel discussion and I'll be doing my very best to ask your questions to the panellists at that point. But well, I'd like to start our session and I'd like to go around each panelist, but starting with Hank. And the question is quite simply, what do we actually mean when we talk about responsible banking from an education perspective, Hank? So I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Right. Regarding the development of a responsible banking, I think according to the Global Sustainable Investor Review 2020, published by the Global Sustainable Investor Airline, the United States and the Asia Pacific region still have room for improving it. It's not, uh, it was not until three years ago that the US, US and the Japan experienced substantial growth in attention to sustainable investment. I think in contrast to uh, European financial institution, uh, the banking industry in Asia needs more knowledge promoting and the training about the responsible banking. In particular, Asia countries like Japan and Taiwan, we have a high saving rates with large trade surplus in current accounts. So uh, they have also become major country for capital export. Therefore, uh, if institutional investor in this country has the right direction about the uh, responsible banking and the clear mindset about the sustainable finance, they would become an important force to change the world sustainable development environment. And I would also like to share some change in Taiwan's banking industry as an example. Yeah, as you may know, Taiwan has a strong manufacturing industry such as a semiconductor. The focus of enterprise finance for the banking sector was on export relax service and the small and the medium size financing. We have a strong competitive advantage and also a good ecosystem in this area. However, the main concern at that time was the growth of GDP only. Banks pay very little attention to environmental issues and the social issues were also lacking. So five years ago, the Taiwanese government began to promote the development of a sustainable finance, also known as the green finance policy. Its policy goal was to induce the momentum of Taiwanese capital to promote the development of all renewable energy power generation projects, including solar energy and the offshore wind power. The policy arm to encourage more financial institutions to participate in renew renewable energy investment and the finance. Uh, in this process, the global experts, including many financial experts from the UK and the North Europe, brought new financial tools and technology to accomplish this task, moving Taiwan closer to the goal of a green energy society and they are so uh, successful for Taiwan's uh, uh, energy need. 
So beginning this year, Taiwan's government expand the scope of sustainable finance to not only environmental issue, but also society, uh, so, uh, society and the governments call the policy Green Finance 2.0. At the same time, Green Finance 2.0 is not only about banks lending department, but also invest department. Individuals and the institutional investor has all been invited to join the progress of ESG finance in Taiwan. So in terms of the results, in the past five years, financing of a contract offshore wind project reached 250 billion NT dollars, which is around the 7 billion pounds. With the help and the experience of a foreign bank in Taiwan, domestic bank and the life insurance company has participated in this syndicate loan. And meanwhile, development of a green bond has also been remarkable. Last year alone, Taiwan accumulated more than 65 green bonds, which total issue of 172 billion NT dollars, approximately 4.5 billion pounds, issued including five major groups. That's a state-owned enterprise, domestic bank, foreign bank, domestic private non-financial company, and the foreign private non-financial company, like the uh, company SPV in the offshore wind power project. With this one response for Taiwanese investor, we look forward to the future development of uh, green bonds. So uh, I think for the responsible bank, Banking is that's mean not only for the business, just Simon has mentioned, it's also a good business. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Hank. It's extremely interesting to get an insight into what's going on in Taiwan and how you've moved from the knowledge, the promotion to actually having the green finance policy, which seems to be making a big difference. So thanks for sharing that with us. I'd like to now move on to Chris and ask the same question of Chris. So quite simply, what do we mean when we talk about responsible, responsible banking from an education perspective, Chris? Yeah, look, I think it's a really important question, and I'm going to give that some local context here in Australia. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of regulatory focus on uh, responsible lending. And so the risk is that we take far too narrow a view. We see this purely in terms of, uh, sort of banking credit and uh, uh, the prudential uh, um, sort of regulation of our banks. But of course, it does go much further. And you know, Australia's banking systems you know, have gone through a, an evolution of purpose. You know, it's a relatively young country, young economy. You know, the banks primarily originated kind of from very much development purposes. How do you open up uh, and, and, and develop uh, the infrastructure that's needed, the industries, uh, the you know, resources industries, agricultural businesses, and so on. But what we're now seeing, of course, is you know, the impact you know, of much of that development. It's getting a lot more complicated. And... Um, uh, now a realization that uh, uh, from both kind of you know, from ethical, uh, from practical, from credit perspectives, and from societal perspectives, and, and uh, uh, you know responsibility, uh, we need to take a more sophisticated approach. So uh, you know I think when we talk about responsible um, finance, responsible banking here in the Australian context, I think what we have to emphasise is it's very much about purpose and impact. Uh, you know, on society and on the environment. Uh, move it out of purely a banking uh, perspective uh, and out of purely a, uh, a sort of credit uh, uh, perspective. And um, I think that that alignment of purpose uh, is something that Australian banking is, is rediscovering. We've perhaps been through a, a journey where we've lost sight of some of that purpose and, uh, uh, you know, that impacted in terms of uh, you know, retail customers it impacted in terms of um, the um, uh, the corporate side, business banking uh, aspect as well. And um, so, it is very much focused on uh, you know rediscovering that purpose, alignment to the United Nations uh, principles, and we have uh, major banks here signed up to those uh, principles. Um, 
to an extent, I would say not driven as much as Hank has described by government, but driven uh, by you know, their own recognition of longer term issues and by the recognition of uh, regulators at a time where still uh, sustainability issues, climate issues um, are still politically uh, somewhat fraught here in Australia. And um, I, I think therefore one of the challenges uh, for banking in Australia is you know, maintaining momentum uh, and doing what needs to be achieved, uh, you know, without necessarily being driven uh, as hard by government as uh, is perhaps occurring in some uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, so the industry is going to have to take more of a lead itself rather than be led. Thanks, Chris. Um, always good to know a bit of the, the background. And I think what I found particularly interesting was the Australian, the young economy, the moving on, and actually the responsible banking driven by the, the recognition aspect, which is absolutely crucial. And also the, the purpose and the impact. It's um, yeah, just fantastic to hear all the work that's going on there. So we'll, we'll hear a bit more about that when we move on to the actual educational side and how it's been approached. But thanks for that. And I'd like to ask the same question of Nora. So what, what do we mean when we talk about responsible banking from the education perspective, Nora? Uh, Jennifer, maybe I just to enrich the dimensions that's already been touched right by Hank and Chris. Maybe I can come from a, from a quote first, right? So good banking is produced not by good laws, but by good bankers, right? And that's not from me. It was 19th century, hardly with us. Uh, but that's, that's the crux of it. Good bankers will ensure responsible banking. Right. And so in addition to what Simon said about saving, right, it's about credit, right? Credit is the core of banking. So we go back to the court because you, you asked how, how this relates to, to training, right? So the core training, credit, understanding what drives value in banking, right? How, and, and you have to know as a good banker, you have to know how to underwrite credit and management of market risk in order for you to then find solutions, financial solutions uh, to, to ensure that our sustainability uh, objectives and outcomes are, are met. So that's how I would link it. Um, and absolutely, it's beyond profit. It's, it's about planet, it's about people, but how do we then help our ecosystem transition? So, um, and, and hence, you know, I, I would like to, to emphasize that for us in Maybank, our mission, and it's not something that we cooked up just in the last one year or two, uh, our mission for about more than 10 years now has been humanize, humanizing banking uh, from the heart of, of society. Uh, and we do self-reflection every year in terms of understanding where are we so that those are not just mere words right? Uh, how do we truly, truly go down to our small, medium enterprises to make sure that they would, can land on their feet sustainably? Um, um, and, and for that, our people need to be skilled enough, knowledgeable enough, right, to, to be able to do that, that role, uh, which is a very different role from bankers of the past, right? This is a really a lot about coaching and consulting and, and building uh, a, a new model of business, right? And this is what transitioning means. And so we go back to uh, fundamentals of, of uh, how to make sure that our, our bankers are able to, be re to do responsible banking from a cap capability and competence perspective. Um, so very quickly, we, we therefore would start with literacy, basic literacy. That's how we approached it internally internally because somebody would you know have a different definition of sustainability with another what exactly does environment and so social and governance mean and how how you should not look at them in isolation so we we want to make sure everybody's brought up to a minimum level of literacy right and then from there ensure that uh we 
progress the organization forward, not just via academics and because really training, and this brings us back to, you know, something that uh, training professionals have known all this while, right? 70, 20, 10, 70 is experiential. 20 is, you know, the, the individual uh, 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 um, coaching uh, and, and only 10% is actually a classroom, right? So we need to look at it from that way. And so like for us, it's just in time, micro, through the mobile phone. So everything is through here, right? Um, and once you've done literacy, you've done certification, then it's just in time. With that, then they are able to then go out and, and ensure that they, they influence the, the society immediately. Maybe I stop there for now. That, thanks so much. That was really interesting. And I will take your quote away from that. Good bankers will ensure responsible banking. I think that's something that's very powerful to us all. So thank you, Nora. So I'd like to come to Philip now and pose the same question, Philip. So if you could pick up from there. Uh, okay, Jennifer, thank you. Um, the other three panelists have, you know, raised a lot of excellent points and, and I think they've basically covered everything. But from my perspective, we're coming together here, uh, different geographies, different size banks, uh, different experiences, uh, different environments, different tax rules, different compliance rules, everything. But there's one common denominator, people. Banking ultimately is a business of people. Right. And when it comes to people, uh, it's important that, you know, we have the right people to ensure that the banking sector uh, maintains its sustainability, um, that the focus is more on the long term versus the short term. And I think this requires a cultural change. Uh, and that cultural change has to start um, for us to to meet the goals of the, the principles of responsible banking. Now, how do we start that culture change? It begins with education, right? And, and that's the key role that we have to focus on is making sure people understand the issues, first of all, and then understand the impacts of not doing anything. And then looking at the opportunities of things that we can do. Uh, and I think that, you know, people have to realize that Bankers have a huge responsibility beyond the bottom line, beyond your next quarter's budget, beyond your annual bonus that you're looking at earning at, at the end of December, uh, to take a much bigger view, much higher level view of uh, society, uh, other people, uh, climate, the environment that you live in, uh, the world that you want to leave your children when, you, when you're finished with your, your banking career. And I think that's what us as bankers, we have to keep sight of uh, a much larger picture. And, and that to me is, is a huge responsibility. And I think uh, we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to our children to make sure that we make the best decisions uh, for them. Okay, thanks, Philip. Um, very interesting. And it's all about the business of people, sums things up very nicely as well. So I would like to stick with you, if I may, and actually talk more about the business of people because this leads on to my next question. And so Philip, for yourself and the Hong Kong Institute of Bankers, how do you approach responsible banking in your curricula and your curriculum, your qualifications and your CPD at the moment? If you could pick up on that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Well, we sort of had to take a stock of where we are uh, where we were, sorry. Um, and we did this through a number of surveys, uh, discussions with, with bankers at all levels. And a report was created by the Hong Kong MA, our regulator, um, last, year, last June, basically identifying uh, four areas where there are gaps in, in the, the professional development of bankers in, in Hong Kong. One of those areas is on ESG, which really touches upon the topic of today's discussion. Um, that a lot of bankers really don't have um, sufficient training uh, in those topics, the ESG topics. And what we're trying to do here at the Institute is we're trying to put those uh, the training topics into our training programs, into our existing training programs. So we're not uh, creating new programs, but we're actually adding topical content to our existing programs. 
And hopefully in this way, we can start uh, building that knowledge base. And we're actually starting it from the secondary school level um, uh, all the way up to university students, as well as the new bankers that are just joining the industry this year. So we're starting at a um, hopefully a early enough point where you know when students start deciding what their education path is that they need to take in order for them to join the industry, that they have those foundational skills um, uh, built up already. Uh, so that it's not something that they start learning on their first day at work, but it's uh, something that they already uh, live that uh, live that education before they even get to the uh, to the industry. Thanks, Philip. Um, very interesting to hear about the early stage development. So I would like to to move on and ask the same question of Hank and find out more what's been done in uh, the Taiwan Academy of Banking and Finance to approach responsible banking. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, uh, from my point of view, well, my organization, the TABF, uh, do really have uh, this uh, program about the responsible banking, but like uh, Philip said, we, uh, like the, we focus on the ESG topic. Uh, I think that the focus of a responsible banking for the perspective of education institution should be enable more financial workers to better understand the latest development in ESG finance, as well as an understanding of uh, international standard and the domestic regulation. So uh, by integrating research by all the party and the professional connecting through international network, the ESG finance can be expanded from a concept into an actually financial service and further internalized into value add chain of the financial industry. So uh, I think only in the way can the profit of a financial institution be efficiently integrated with the sustainable development need of the world and the society and the profit of a financial institution be pre prevents from becoming an obstacle to sustainable development. Uh, I would like to introduce my organization uh, programs. Uh, beginning in 2021, in line with the policy of uh, government, uh, the TABF began the training on ESG finance, mainly focus on the professional knowledge and the skill required for the development of a sustainable financial in financial institution. The whole program is divided into four parts. The first is a training for leader and the manager. The course, the course includes an introduction to international sustainable financial trend, green finance disclosure standard, CSR standard and the TCFD structure and the central. It also includes training about sustainable blueprint development. Yeah, we hope that uh, all the students would be able to structure their own print for the developer of ESG finance. That is their own ESG strategy. The second part of the training is for the worker in the finance and operation department of financial institutions. The main training content is on ESG investor investment decision making, assisting the finance department to understand ESG invest investment method and the risk assessment in invest, investment decision. Another key point in this part is in training on the use of a sustainable accounting standard, such as SAP standard through the disclosure of a relevant institution ESG data, all investors may gain more reference to further true governments. And the third part is for the risk management of financial institutions. In addition to a deep understanding of environmental risk, they also are trained to manage this risk. For example, they discuss how to respond to the occurrence of a different environmental risk and the reduce losses. By the way, all issues about supervision are included in this section. Taiwan own policy and the regulation as well as international standard are all introduced in this session. And the, finally, the first part is armed as a bank business staff. 
training is conduct on various ESG related things. For example, they are case study and the practical operation training in the capacity of a project finance. The cases of uh, renewable energy infrastructure is used to understand financial business opportunity in the whole green supply chain management so that train, training can create more green finance service and the product. In addition, there also have some courses in the part of ESG investment, especially about uh, relate to the wealth management. So uh, right now that's my, my organization's program, but I think we still have a lot of room to be improvement. So uh, all the uh, good example of a CBI's course is our uh, wonderful uh, idol to follow. Yeah, that's my, my experience. Thank you. Thanks, Hank. Always interesting to hear about what's going on at other banking institutes and your, your four-part ESG training sounds very comprehensive and very practical, but also interesting to note that like all organisations and all banks, there's always room for more to be done. So thanks for sharing that. If I can move on to Nora now, I'd be really interested in what's been done um, on the same sort of basis, Nora, um, with yourself. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. We've got the core aspects, right? That even though it's core, you still need to refine and make it relevant, right? So, uh conventional five c's right the, the character assessment cap capacity capital condition collateral uh, even in those aspects there is a need to provide a dictionary in terms of so that's what we're doing uh making them uh more directly linked towards how how do how do they assess uh palm oil and other crops right uh, uh in terms of the application assessment but now we've added another three dimensions to the to the five C's, right? And and that's related to what Simon was saying earlier in terms of the human aspect. So how how are they going to understand how to assess from a cooperation, uh, uh, coordination, and contingencies, right? Uh, aspect. So so we've already added. I mean, the, the first five is already complex enough to try to customize. Now we've added another three. Uh, so that's very uh, intensively being looked at right now. And then the other point, just to emphasize uh, what uh, Hank had mentioned, uh, making sure that uh, the, the systemics, yeah, the, everything is looked at, at, at in totality. And how do we achieve that? Um, it's, it's really a lot, like I said, about how to make sure that they are equipped as they are doing the job, right? Um, and really we are, this is, I know it's a cliche, but we really truly are rebuilding. Uh, millions have, have lost jobs and, and you know, um, just in our backyard here, uh, you know, millions of businesses have, have closed, right? So how do we, we don't have time to, it's no longer linear, it's really non-linear, right? So giving uh, people the basics, giving them a dictionary, giving them, uh, uh, a, a platform for, for the, the knowledge that they need from their mobile phones and then actually sending them out there with coaching, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, immediate coaching provided to, to them. So there's the, the technical part because they need, they need to understand how to uh, look at product development, right, uh, in, in terms of the solutioning but they need competency in terms of the applicability of, of those aspects. Um, we have green labs. Maybe that's something that I could uh, add to the, to the list that, that uh, Hank had highlighted. We have live green labs. Um, and this is really taking agility. I mean, even before COVID-19 hit us because of digitalization, uh, you know, organizations across the world, including us, have been doing a lot of hackathons and then getting people on agile modes but it's no longer about that. It's now about living agility, really behaving in an agile manner. 
uh, uh, so the green lab is is one way we bring everybody together and and solution for for um, any uh, uh, application that that we receive. Uh, so that I think in a nutshell is is uh, how we're approaching uh, how we how we making the the uh, competence uh, you know uh, get to a higher level quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, Nora, because obviously, as you say, you've got the technical part, but it's the building, the competence, the practical application. Those are the elements that make the real difference, that make all the training relevant. So that, that's really interesting to know what's going on. So thanks for sharing that. So I'd like to come to Chris. And Chris, if you can share some info about what's going on at Finzia. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think... Uh put us back to the variations uh, you know, across this panel and people attending today. And a good illustration, I think, is uh, the approach I'm going to describe quite a structured approach, uh, being led by regulators, looking at the skills of the uh, uh, banking profession needed going forwards. Uh, we're in a different place. We're really still at that stage of trying to establish that need, uh, create that appetite um, for knowledge. I, I thought it was interesting, and I, and I just did a quick check uh, you know, thinking about that regulatory aspect um, on uh, a recently issued credential guide from APRA, uh, the Australian Credential Regulator, uh, on climate risk management. And I did a search on training and I did a search on education. And the only references at all within that credential guide are training for board members uh, and education for senior executives. Um, and I think that that's a real challenge. Um, and that, I think, is a, a good example of where the industry needs to ensure it's taking responsibility um, and, and really taking a lead. Um, and I very much see that uh, you know, our approach as an industry educator, firstly, has to be um, to try and establish that the, there is an industry need here, uh, that uh, uh, you know, we need advocates, we need individuals to be um, aware uh, of that need. So often it's CPD perhaps is, is perhaps where we start, which is kind of unusual for education formally. One goes the other way around, but it, it's really getting our senior bankers uh, aware of the issues, understanding of the issues, understanding um, of the kind of skills, gaps uh, that are emerging. And um, you know, I know we'll talk later on uh, about some more specifics of those gaps, but um, you know, I think we're very much at that stage now, which will then lead to the uh, Nora spoke earlier about going from uh, the, the sort of agreement around terminology to certification, and you know will take us on to the uh, the certification stage. So it feels a little more haphazard, perhaps, than uh, uh, some of my colleagues uh, you know have outlined. But uh, we benefit enormously from international experience, and I have to say, uh, you know, our work with the Chartered Bankers uh, Institute, but also with the Asia Pacific Association of Banking Institutes, um, and interaction with uh, you know, other institutes you know, has been you know, excellent in terms of raising awareness um, of what is going on uh, in uh, other countries, uh, the education that, that is available, that is being uh, undertaken um, and, and being undertaken at the front line of banking, uh, which I think is uh, the key challenge here. Simon talked about the need to develop the skills uh, required at scale. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's the challenge. We're not going to be that one person at the time. We very much have to um, make sure that we do get uh, ultimately the buy-in from uh, institutions, if not from regulators, and um, more both. That this is uh, you know a scale issue, and a, uh, uh, that these skills you know, aren't skills that just need to be uh, understood or, or held by board members and senior executives. Uh, these really do need to integrate with fundamental banking skills. Um, and indeed, you cannot apply your fundamental skills if you don't understand the context. Um, and responsible banking is really just another way of describing context in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for um, that. Yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer, would you mind if I um, jump in a little bit here on, on what Chris has said? Uh, one of my observations in Hong Kong is that there is a discrepancy between banks. Um, you know, if, if I might generalize a little bit, but the global banks tend to be much more ahead of the curve in terms of responsible banking than the, the local banks that we have here in, in Hong Kong. 
And really what I see uh, the, the Institute's role here is that we have to create a, a, an equal playing field for everybody. Uh, not, you know, the, the, the smaller banks don't necessarily have the resources to create the training programs that the larger banks can. Um, and I think we need to be able to bring up their skill level up to, you know, the levels that the, the bankers at the bigger banks enjoy. Okay, and, and in some cases take for granted. Um, I mean, uh, Chris talked about uh, making sure that the senior bankers are aware of the issues. Um, just from my personal experience, um, when Al Gore came out with his uh, movie uh, uh, about the uh, uh, climate issues, um, the bank that I was at basically sent the, you know, the management team, the senior management team to a number of climate workshops where we worked alongside scientists to understand the impact of uh, carbon emissions on the, uh, on, the, on the global warming and on the atmosphere and, and basically the impact of mankind on the planet. And because we had that understanding, we can then bring that back to the bank and look at how we're utilizing resources, look at how we're um, you know, making uh, financing decisions, look at how we uh, treat uh, people and how we bring more inclusiveness to banking. And I think that's really helpful uh, that we do that. And I think, you know, um, that's something that I benefited from. And I, you know, I was lucky because of, of my position, but I think all bankers should also have that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You make a, an extremely good point there, Philip. And it's all linked in, I suppose, to identifying, Chris has identified that in Australia, there are gaps, the industry needs to take the lead. We all need to start somewhere if we've not progressed as speedily as we would like. And I think it's having those senior advocates, but actually, importantly, looking at how we can all work together, collaborate and do things that make a difference. And the points that Chris has covered and that you've added there to, to fill up um, actually link directly to our next question, which we've perhaps answered as we've been going through the conversations but um, just picking up on a point that Simon raised earlier, I'd like to ask Nora, first of all, about who you think needs to learn about responsible banking, Nora. Can you repeat, please? Uh, I heard that, sorry. Absolutely. It's simply, who do you think should be learning about responsible banking? Oh. Is it the specialists? What, what are your thoughts, Nora? I, you know, I think I, I, I did uh, highlight what my view much, much uh, from, from the very beginning. It's everyone because whilst we do have specialists, all right, um, so maybe I'll come back to the question shortly, but I wanted to expand on because um, uh, Chris mentioned ad advocacy. So yes, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, actually uh, been building communities within our organization uh who uh, these are new jobs these are new roles right uh that we are supposed to all of us we're supposed to be uh designing a, a lot a lot more uh, because of digitalization because of man machine algorithm and now uh the sustainability overlay right so we've got um esg certified coaches in the pipeline uh just as we have over the last uh 24 months created uh, mental health well-being uh, certified first aiders in the organization. So very much along those lines. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we actually need to ensure that as, uh, as Simon mentioned earlier, it becomes standard, it becomes business as usual. And the only way for it to become a business as usual is when you have the ecosystem all lined up and aligned. Which brings me, uh, I think, to the uh, other component of, of uh, the, the question. When we say it's everybody, then everybody understands what their role is. The enabling environment needs to be there. So the governance part, right? So, so for us, because otherwise it's going to be very hard. Um, we are a 60 plus year old organization. Um, the banks that Philip was referring to, uh, one of them was, you know, I spent nine and a half years in, are uh, all almost 200 years old, right? So uh, it's people are, you know, used to doing things the way uh, they have been. 
uh, even though they've been reskilled or given new knowledge. So the governance, the enabling ecosystem in the organization needs to be looked at. So what we've done is in addition to uh, uh, the horizontal, if you like, so the, the, the certified coaches, the ESG certified coaches, um, we, have the, uh, we have established an exco level sustainability committee uh, which sets the tone and which then ensures that blockages, misalignments, you know, down deeper in the organization are very quickly green laned, if you like. I use the word, <laughs> the, the, the color green a lot, uh, right? Are quickly green laned for resolution. And on top of that, I think we, we must be one of the few, uh, I think, yeah, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, especially in this in these parts of the world where there is a board level uh, uh, sustainability committee being formally set up. So I think that the tone needs to be set right. The enabling ecosystem needs to be in place. Um, so the this is the long answer <laughs> to the question, uh, uh, Jennifer, that absolutely it's got to be everybody in the, the um, organization. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. And the long answer to a question is more than acceptable because it gives us a really good insight to what's going on in your organisation. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, if I can pose the same question to Hank, um, who do you think needs to learn about responsible banking, Hank? Okay, thank you. I think I, I totally agree that Nora's opinion that everyone in the industry should uh, have uh, to learn about the responsible banking. Just like uh, Philip mentioned, the question is about the people. And the people in this uh, uh, banking sector should be on the, just only concern about the money. So I like to uh, category the three kind of the uh, capability that need to be passed on the financial industry in the next few years. So the most basic thing is to ensure that all participants are aware of a global development trend of a responsible banking, so as to reduce the difficulty of a concept promoting when company managers start to reform the in, uh, financial institutions. Second, for uh, junior and the middle level manager in the financial industry, it's necessary to be able to integrate the needs of a customer and the older investor with the essential element of ESG finance, so that the ESG concept can be used to promote the growth of a financial institutions. And the third training goal is the ability of a high-ranking manager. Yeah, I think that uh, these uh, high-ranking managers, they must have the ability can reform their established organization principle and the fully integrate ESG into the development path of the bank and the whole financial institution. But uh, it's uh, very difficult right now, but to achieve all these three education goals, I think more industry experience and the international connection will be needed. Just Simon mentioned in the beginning, we have, a, we, we have a two uh, expand the uh, good practice to all the uh, participants in this industry. So for uh, this whole uh, region, I looking forward the TABF can have a more exchange with uh, uh, expert, uh, especially our CBI members that we can exchange the uh, success story about the, the uh, ESG finance and uh, we can let everyone in the industry have the awareness of the uh, responsible banking. Thank you. Thanks, Hank. I know there's a lot of um, good work going on at TABF, so excellent to hear though, at the points that you're raising. I'd like to bring Chris in on this point, if I may, Chris. Yeah, I know we've got lots to cover. I'm particularly interested in this and I wanted to add a perhaps broader perspective. Uh, Finzia, uh, in fact, covers the banking uh, sector, but also covers the security sector. Um, and uh, so in response to the question, you know, who needs to understand this? Actually, I think it's, it's a tremendous strength uh, if one takes a whole of finance view of this. Uh, there's been a couple of comments made in the chat um, by Simon Fuchs about the role of investors 
and investors in the banks. And certainly that's a very significant driver uh, for banks, particularly in Australia, very much relies on uh, offshore capital um, and net import of capital. And therefore, uh, you know, I think that uh, um, it goes broader than simply that everyone banking, uh, I, I would take that as a given. And, and I would say that in the same way as a tie this back to kind of fundamental purpose, um, of course, everyone has to understand the purpose of, of their role. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, you cannot expect them to apply judgment. You cannot expect them to understand the ethics and, and some of the ethical challenges of their roles if they don't understand the purpose. But I'd go broader and say, let's also think about who influences um, on us as bankers and on our banks, um, because they also need to be brought into fold. So I think as we think about education, uh, let's not just think about uh, bankers, but let's think about uh, funds managers and investment advisors. And let's think about company directors. What are the collaborations that are possible um, for other stakeholders in finance uh, and in governance to uh, uh, help uh, ensure that if you're, you know, the, the, you're pushing them an open door with these other stakeholders, that they're at a, a similar level of understanding. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a real strength of the recent uh, climate risk certificate uh, that has been launched by the Chartered Alliance uh, in the UK with Chartered Bankers, Chartered Insurance Institute and Chartered Institute Securities Investment that it is that whole of finance view. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I would kind of you know, uh, go beyond our, our banking and uh, add others into that list as well. Uh, and we can play a role in educating them. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I think what you've done when you've been explaining that, you've also probably answered a couple of the chat room questions. So that's always good too. But um, thanks for sharing that. So um, finally, on this point, Philip, do you have any additional points that you would like to add over and above what the panellists have been saying? No, I'm just reading some of the chat items and, and a lot of people are bringing up, you know, how do you evaluate risk and how do you evaluate certain deals? Um, and it's, some, it's quite challenging, right? Because the traditional way of evaluating a, a transaction, net, net PV, a cash flow type of analysis, doesn't necessarily work for a lot of uh, green projects simply because of the stage that they're in. And you know, when, when we talk about these types of things, the government in a lot of countries have to take the lead before the investor. I mean, let's, let's get honest, right? The government has to take a lead before the investors would be, would be willing to put their money into these transactions. And I think you know, the governments are starting to realize that. So you see a lot of the, the project financing deals that are, that are happening in, in Asia anyways, um, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of that is started by the government or by a near sovereign type entity, uh, followed by the, the banks then coming in afterwards. Okay. Thanks for adding to that, Philip. I, I think what's clear, well, Simon, would you like to? No, I thought I might, I might come in on, on risk as, as well, if I, if I may. And uh, I sort of started uh, replying in the, in the chat function as well. I think it was Simon and uh, a, a fellow Simon and uh, Chen who asked questions on this. Um, but there's a much wider perspective when we think about risk here. It's, it's not just risk on uh, sort of green and sustainable projects themselves. Um, you know, really where we should be focusing is looking at climate, environmental, nature-based risks, um, broader so social sustainability risks you know, throughout banks lending portfolios, because that's where the greatest impact is, is going to be. I mean, Philip's quite, quite right in terms of kind of de-risking new technologies and things, the role of governments and development banks and things is absolutely key for getting those projects off the ground. Um, but but uh, where the, the, the risks, the, where the major risk to banks are is in existing portfolios, because um, you know, we don't know exactly how how global warming is going to develop. You know, it will be slightly different in different parts of the world. We also don't know how effective the climate action that governments and others will take will be. But one thing we do know is that, you know, in all future scenarios, um, global temperatures are going to increase and the physical and transition risks of climate change are going to increase too. We don't know what the balance between physical risk and, and transition risk will be, but they will both, both increase in all scenarios. Um, and these need to be understood as, as cross-cutting, as transverse risks that impact on all other risk types. And at the moment, I think many banks sort of um, tend to have central climate risk teams, which is probably a good place to start. 
Um, but ultimately, climate risk and broader sustainability risks have to be embedded into uh, the risk governance frameworks, the risk appetites, the, uh, the risk management sort of frameworks, the risk culture right across institutions. Um, and there are challenges to that, challenges around capacity and capability of risk professionals, um, and also challenges around the availability, the, uh, the comparability, the consistency of, of data uh, too. Um, but it's one area that um, central banks, regulators, and a lot of bodies like ourselves are putting a lot of, of work into. And uh, Chris, you kindly mentioned the um, you know the certificate and climate risk we've recently developed as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I would encourage uh, for those of you who are interested, you know, take a look at our website and you find out more about climate risk there. Yeah, I just want to echo what um, what Simon just raised. I mean, I think we tend to focus on transactional risk a lot, probably too much, uh, when we're talking about um, responsible banking. We need to look at it at a much much higher level. And look at the you know the exposure of your institution to climate issues around the world, not just in your area uh, of the world, but other areas of the world. I mean, one big example of this is the California wildfires. I mean, imagine if your bank had a huge exposure to real estate in California, and suddenly that happens. What what's the impact of something like that to your balance sheet, to your risk profile, uh, and also to the clients that that have impacts indirectly to those, uh, to those exposures. Think about it from that perspective, as opposed to a you know, specific um, financing of a specific refinery, let's say in, in one part of the world. It's, it's a much bigger issue than, than just a transaction. It, it, it is, it is right. And, we, we, and if I can build on that as well, the, the other aspect is to think about risk through supply chains as as well um so if you think of the example of say um you know rising sea levels causing flooding in uh, in bangladesh for instance um now from a uk perspective we might think well you know that's a humanitarian problem but what does it mean for for uk businesses well if uk businesses have outsourced manufacturing to to bangladesh you know possibly workers may not be able to get to the factory. The factory may be underwater. There may, it may be impossible to move you know, finished, finished goods from the factory to the ports. The ports might be out of action. You know, we've, we've seen this year the problems with shipping and supply chains and things. So actually, you know, a, uh, even a physical risk event on the other side of the world can create sort of problems throughout, throughout supply chains. And then clearly for the, for the banks that are lending to parts of the supply chain, you know, or to the company that's, that's dependent and sits at the top of the supply chain. Jennifer, I wonder if we could also bring this back to um, capabilities, competencies, because I think you know, this integration of risk as Simon's described, I mean, obviously it's rendering many, many of our current risk models uh, far less effective. You know, our uh, risk grading systems and scorecard systems and so on uh, don't help us when we're experiencing you know, climate change at this kind of pace. And therefore, you know, it, it really does undermine, to the extent those have been used as tools to like dumb down banking, we actually have to reverse that. Uh, we actually have to recognize that uh, we are gonna have to educate people and they are going to have to apply judgment. Thanks, Chris. Before I move on to the next question, that's been a really, um good conversation that we've had. So I'd like to just ask um, if Nora or Hank would like to come in with any additional points on the, the, the areas that we've been talking about there before I move on. Nola? Okay. Hi, Hank, do you have an additional no, point you would like to make? I, I think uh, our uh, panelists uh, just mentioned a lot of uh, um, topical uh, how, how to say that, difficult issue about how to evaluate the risk management. So uh, I, I, in, in my organization, um, we, we start to do uh, research about, uh, just I mentioned about the TCFD structure to uh, help the uh, financial institutions uh, try to have a, a, a methodology about how to uh, evaluate the risk. But, I think uh, in reality, they still have a, a huge room to be improvement to know the better practices. So I think in the future, I uh, we have a more um, 
experience have to learn from uh, all the expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Nora? Yeah, Jennifer, I think, yeah, something that struck me as, as I was listening um, uh, that needs to be mentioned, I believe, is measures. Because, you know, of course, what gets measured gets done, but you measure the wrong things, the wrong things get done. So that's very, very risky. Uh, so both from an organizational perspective, uh, you know, how do we help our people um, who are now being skilled and reskilled and enabled, right, to, to be able to actually support the ecosystem in the transition? Uh, and, and therefore, how, how are they measured and rewarded and, and incentivized? So that's one. Um, the other, of course, is uh, from the uh, investors, shareholders perspective as well, right? Um, I think there needs to be also that congruence. Right now, it's a little incongruent and it's not going to be very efficient for, for the different parts to move at the same pace. So I'm worried about that. I wanted to park that out. Uh, and the other one, of course, is therefore then how do you make it, um, uh, again, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, a standard. Um, one of the ways that we are doing it uh, is to set a target. So it's, it's putting a check and balance on ourselves. So we've targeted uh, 1 million hours on sustainability for our, our internal workforce. And, and that's, if you work the mats out, we're about 43,000 people. We're in 18 countries. So 1 million is achievable. Um, but that sets the tone again in terms of how to make it a culture, right? And that we assess, right? There is a, a panel that assesses and that's the uh, executive committee level sustainability uh, committee that, that looks at. So there is a check and balance in terms of the one minute hours, but then that helps people, uh, you know, actually channel conversations towards how to, how to, you know, um, even even discuss the risk aspects and then what are the possible solutions, and then get the coordination together to to put out the right solution. So I think th those are the two that I wanted to add uh, two dimensions, Jennifer. No, that, that's great. Thank you for that, Nora. And interesting to hear about the, the target setting and the number of hours um, very much. That should set the tone. And as you, you to use a phrase that you had, it should make the culture. So it's, it's interesting to know that that's going on too. So thank you for that. So I'd like to just finish with one additional question. Um, and then we'll move on to several questions that have came through via the, the chat room. And this is one that I'm going to put to Philip and Chris initially, if I may. And I know that the two of you have some examples that you would like to share with us. And the question is, how will you embed the principles for responsible banking and sustainability more broadly into your education and training? So Philip. So, uh, that's a very good question. Um, it starts with communication and it starts with, you know, buy-in. And unfortunately in Hong Kong anyways, um, getting, and, and this might be a, a little bit contradictory to what people would expect, uh, especially of a, a culture like in Hong Kong, but getting the learning culture uh, of, of the banking community, uh, getting that um, consistent, getting that to a high standard um, is somewhat challenging. Um, bankers need to upgrade themselves and, and bankers need to recognize that that upgrade of their skills is especially important in this environment. You know, in the past, um, bankers look at change in terms of years, okay? You, you're talking about a five-year plan. With the advent of technology with the disruption that we're seeing in the industry today, we don't have the benefit of a five-year plan. We're looking at a five-month plan in some cases. And bankers need to realize that, you know, unless they upgrade themselves, unless they understand the different skills that may be needed in the next, you know, half year to a year, uh, they face the risk of falling behind their peers. And I think that involves a learning culture that has been placed. And 
banks can have resources, banks can have training budgets, banks can uh, institute training, um, but until the practitioners actually take that responsibility on themselves, it's not gonna work. Now, my challenge at HKIB is making sure that the training programs are delivered um, in an entertaining, in an innovative way. Probably the old ways of having somebody stand at the front of the room lecturing a group of bankers is not going to work. So we have to look at different ways of educating them, incorporating different uh, methods within the same course. So you can have lectures, you can have a, a panel discussion, you can have videos or maybe even a webinar, uh, a simple Q&A session, all built into that one course to keep the attention of the bankers today, because I think that is very important uh, for us to deliver the message, uh, communicating the message and getting it out so that everybody understands you know, the, the risk that we're facing going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Philip. Chris, I know you had a few points you'd like to raise on that one, too. Yeah, and so that integration, I mean, I think we probably even start back before education and say, you know, it really comes down to clarity of purpose. And I suppose I mentioned that earlier uh, in the discussion this evening. And I think that, you know, that's where it's, it's the kind of loss of that clarity of purpose that perhaps has allowed people to sit on their, their existing skill sets, sit on their laurels. And I think exactly as Philip has said, there's a going to be a rude awakening uh, if people don't realise that they, they're falling behind on their skills. And you know, to the extent we've got away with it because of the, um, the sort of, kind of the automation of uh, credit that has taken place, the automation uh, you know, of banking. But as I say, that, that, that's unwinding. That's, that has to unwind when one's entering into new risk areas, which are highly localised, um, relatively specialised, which do require uh, an understanding of uh, new types of risk or, or, or rec newly recognised uh, risks. Um, you know, we, that, that purpose also comes from seeking to bring that back to professionalism um, and to pride and tie it into, you know, you have responsibility to be competent. Uh, you know, that's the kind of the education aspect, but also part of education is an education in ethics uh, and a responsibility to be ethical. Uh, and, and that's both in terms of uh, uh, the application of these skills on a personal basis, but also uh, the way in which you support your organization's uh, purpose. We've spoken about, uh, you know, many of the world's uh, uh, major banks are signing up uh, to uh, you know, responsible banking principles. Um, they need to obviously ensure that their people are equipped to uh, support those, but also they need to ensure that those people are motivated um, and, uh, you know, understand the kind of the ethical aspects of uh, what they're trying to achieve and have an ethical responsibility uh, to support uh, the commitments of their organization um, with regards to responsible banking and an ethical responsibility to call it out when organizations are not living up to the commitments that they've made. So um, I think uh, on education, we can focus on education skills and that's obviously important, uh, but it, it's the application of those skills which is also a really key part uh, of education. Uh, and it's the reason I'd rather about education than training. Um, training teaches you how to do a task. Education, I hope, teaches you about why it's important and how you should do it. Thanks, Chris. I'm very conscious of time here, and I know that we're, we're looking to move on and ask um, some audience questions. Nora, do you have anything that you would like to add to the, that point there? Yeah, Jennifer, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think I wanna, I wanna emphasize the point on diversity and inclusivity here, right? Because um, one way of not making it this academic is to make it real, right? And, and to make it real, what we do, for example, is we do communities, community building, because, you know, and how to bring people into the subject, into the subject matter, right? Uh, it can't be a single, uh, uh, path. Uh, for example, we've got in our curricula uh, urban farming, right? So that's one, right? It's, it's not just something remote that when you go and talk to customers or, uh, who's, doing, who's doing agriculture, you know, that, then you, you, you come from it from a very uh, impersonal uh, 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 approach. So urban farming is today uh, in our official curricula. 
uh, it's got a huge following, all right? And we started with an experiment. I don't know how many of you, please come and visit us, but you know, I don't know how many of you know, but our headquarters in Kuala Lumpur is right smack in the middle of an area which is known to be the most polluted pre-COVID, <laughs> pre-COVID, right? And yet to kick off the, our urban farming uh, curricula, we actually had a farm uh, uh, in, the, in the compounds of our building, right? And lo and behold, right, within, within um, less than a year, it was flourishing, we had harvests, and the harvest we actually donated to the shelters around uh, our, our uh, we, were, we are also surrounded by urban poor. Uh, so, you know, and, and people saw that with their own eyes and then we started seeing uh, the community and the community is our Maybank staff, right? The community grow, right? And then we, we, of course, lifted that urban farm and dropped it into our academy, which made a lot more sense because our academy is on, uh, uh, on the outskirts of town. And, and then we could have uh, a larger farm uh, grow from there. So that's just one example of how we create communities within the different aspects of sustainability, the, the E, right? So that's the environment, but then don't forget social. So we are, I, I truly agree with you, uh, Simon, this is not about CSR, but it is, it is about making sure that uh, the idea of sustainability also goes into how we help people. So, you know, the old, old adage of don't just teach people to fish. I mean, don't just give people fish, teach them to fish, right? Uh, and, and there's a lot of wisdom there. So, so what we do is bring that into people who love people, you know, and, and not just plants. Find you, this is another community uh, where they, they go out and we've actually got a target of improving the lives of 1 million households uh, uh, across ASEAN. Um, so we've got our urban, for example, our uh, eco weavers, uh, which we target single mothers who are, uh, who, who uh, are, you know, need to earn an income, right? This, this program of ours in Cambodia uh, is wonderful because, and again, it's sustainable, right? Because what we do is we combine, we, we, we bring them into a, a training school for, for weaving, right? And then uh, brought some, some farmers to help grow mulberry trees. Then they can grow silkworms, right? And so, you know, the whole community and then connect them with uh, a bias of, of their, their fabrics. Uh, so that's sustainability. But, but our people, you know, look, didn't look at it as training, <laughs> right? So it's more of building communities, it's that passion. And, and it starts growing, right? The, 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 um, the capability and ability. So that's, I think, another angle I wanted to provide, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you. What a, what a fantastic few examples to share with us, Nora, of how it actually works in practical terms. That's um, really, really um, encouraging the way that that's working. So thanks so much for sharing that. A very final word from Hank, if there's any additional points you would like to add to to notice Hank, and then I'll, I'll move on to the questions. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. I want to, well, I have a short response to about the question about how to embed the PRB to uh, organization training program. In, um, Taiwan is not yet a member of the United Nations, so uh, Taiwan's bank cannot part participate in the PRB. So that's a, a Although the financial institutions has begun to express their concern about sustainable finance and uh, have also made special behavior change, but it's a pity that they are limited by the political factors. So uh, that's uh, the responsibility of my organization, the TABF, that uh, we will try to find out more of the good practice of the international standard to in introduce, induce to the, the Taiwan's uh, banking uh, industry and uh, they, they know the principle and the spe uh, spell the, the, the spirit of a PRB to, to all the bankers in Taiwan. So that's, uh, that's my sole response. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hank. Now let, let us move on. That ends the formal part of the discussions. Um, which we, we had a lot of really good discussions. So thanks very much for that. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. And Philip, 
There's actually one um, for yourself. So firstly, it thanks you for your passionate talk about the future of all instead of only year-end bonuses. But the question itself is, have you come across examples where bonuses are back paid based on the organization's green banking impact, such as maybe like after five years, if sanctioned loans achieves ESG targets, bonuses will be paid, et cetera? Um, I, I thought I mentioned in the chat, but uh, I just used myself as an example. Okay. Uh, when, I, when I was at the HSBC, um, some of my bonus was paid in cash, but some of it was deferred over three years. Now, depending on how the bank performs uh, uh, over those three years, I, you know, I may or may not get the, the bonuses uh, for, those, for those years. So that is one example. Now, I think the questioner asked about clawback, and that's somewhat difficult because um, you know, if you pay the cash away, it's, it's very difficult to get that cash back. Um, so I think the banks don't really do it that way. They rather do a more, a more of a deferral uh, method. Uh, they may look at the measures uh, as opposed to one year measure. They may look at a, a two or three year measure. So that's, that's another way for them to, to set their remuneration policy. Okay, that, thanks for that, Philip. And what I think will be our, our last question and for every banking transaction to be green or sustainable, what do we feel is actually required? Um, so, for example, sustainability experts in banks, aligned taxonomy, government policies, or more importantly, is it education for SMEs so that they understand the conditions required to apply for green loans or insurance? So who would like to, to pick up on that one? Jennifer, I'm happy to I'm happy to come in. Um, so I, I refer the question. So I refer the questioner to my my opening remarks. What what do we require so that every transaction is kind of green and sustainable? Well, we require a, uh, the capacity, capability, and culture right across uh, banking and finance that aligns banks, bankers, and banking with sustainability. You know, and I hope that's come out in the in the panel discussion. You know, Philip and Hank and Nora and Chris sort of all all made these points. It's it's not about um any one thing about sort of you know, whether it's a regulatory intervention, whether it's about better data and so on. Ultimately it is like so many things down to culture. Um, and how do we drive culture? Yes, we drive it through education and training. We also drive it through governance, through tone at the top through um, uh, incentives and remuneration and many other drivers. Um, but if we are going to align all of finance, then you know, too many of these in interventions, and we discussed this earlier on the panel, focus at that executive level. And that's wrong. This needs to be for all bankers everywhere for all time. Okay. Thanks, Simon. And that's a, a very good note to, to end for all bankers at all times. So thanks so much. So we now come to the, the end of our session. And I'd really like to thank, on behalf of the Chartered Banker Institute, Simon, and obviously myself, I'd like to thank Hank, Nora, Philip, and Chris for giving up their time and sharing their expertise with us on our topic, which was all about what responsible banking means for the education, training, and development of bankers. We had a lot of really good free-flowing conversations, lots of insightful thoughts, great examples of what's going on in your organisations. So personally, I found that to be a real value and I very much hope the audience felt exactly the same. So thank you so much for that. So we're now actually at the very end of the 2021 annual banking conference. This is the very last session. So I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all our attendees, all of the panelists, not just today, and also all of the keynote speakers for joining us this year and contributing to such a great event. So thank you again, everyone, and please enjoy the remainder of your day. Thank you very much. Goodbye.